Hello and welcome to a lecture on an introduction to biasing. My name is Steve Ellingson. This lecture is about biasing transistors. This is a task that we need to accomplish to use transistors for RF amplifiers uh, or for oscillators. So this applies generally and I'm going to give you the uh, essentials here and then we'll go into more details in later lectures. Here I will first discuss how to select a bias point. I'll discuss the topic of fixed bias, which is something that you should never do, and I'll explain why, and the reason, in short, is this issue of thermal runaway. I'll briefly introduce you to the topic of self-bias, which is one way to address the problem of thermal runaway, and then we'll talk about the path forward. And I'll very briefly discuss the topic of active bias, which is something that we may not address in more detail later, but something that's good to know about, and it's a pretty simple idea. Now in this lecture I'm going to be focusing on bipolar transistors, but the principles are very similar for FETs. Okay, first, selecting a bias point. For a bipolar transistor, selecting a bias point means choosing an appropriate and desirable value of the collector emitter voltage and the collector current. And of course, if we're talking about FETs, then we're talking about uh, VGS and I sub D. Now we want to choose these parameters such that in the bipolar case, the transistor is forward active biased because that's what we need to make it work as an amplifier and we need sufficient voltage swing available at the output. Now for a common emitter transistor, which looks like this, where this is the input and this is the output, uh, what we need is to arrange the bias so that we have sufficient swing to accommodate an RF signal on the output. Now of course we also need desirable small signal characteristics. And by small signal, of course, I mean RF. And what that means is we would like to select a bias point such that we get S parameters which are reasonable to use and facilitate solutions that have the characteristics we're looking for. So the method that you may have already learned for choosing a bias point for a transistor involves characteristic curves. So most students encounter curves that look like this for uh, bipolar transistors and there's various ways to arrange these curves and you lay in load lines and you select uh, uh, currents and voltages based on an analysis involving charts that look like that. At RF this data is typically not provided. Uh, sometimes it is but not often. The more common method, I would say uh, by far the most common method, is to use recommendations from a data sheet. So typically what happens is you choose a transistor that uh, will accommodate your application and the data sheet will suggest some choices for the uh, bias point and uh, it will also list S parameters for those particular choices. An example of this is the Avago AT41511 which we discussed in a previous lecture. In that case, the data sheet lists a few bias points and provides S parameters for those bias points. And if you have any other bias point that you'd prefer to use, well, you have to do something else to get those values. Which brings us to the other common alternative for how to select bias points, which is to use a device model. So increasingly, uh, manufacturers of transistors will provide an equivalent circuit model, which is suitable for use in common uh, simulation tools and then you can experiment with that simulation model to get the bias point that you want and uh, then quickly generate the S parameters. So both these methods are, are in fairly common use. So just to give you some feeling for how this works, here's two examples. First, the Avago AT41511, uh, which I just mentioned. That's an NPN silicon uh, BJT. In this example I ask you to check out the data sheets for this device uh, commonly available on the internet. You should go ahead and, and pull those uh, from the internet and uh, take a look at them. Uh, very educational experience. And uh, in this example I'm asking you to determine some reasonable operating points. 
you'll find this device is well characterized for four possible bias points. That is, when the collector current is 5 milliamps and 25 milliamps, and the collector emitter voltage is 2.7 volts and 5 volts. Now, this is the manufacturer telling you that uh, these are uh, four bias points which uh, they uh, support and uh, for which they are willing to provide uh, additional data. In particular, they list the S parameters for all four of those bias conditions. And also they list uh, noise figure characterization data, which is useful if you want to use this transistor in a low noise application. Now, as I point out here, this is certainly not to say that other operating points are not possible or even recommended. However, typically the manufacturer's recommendations represent a pretty good set of options uh, for initial design. And if you want to fiddle with those, it, it should probably be for a pretty good reason. So for many applications, one of these four bias points would probably be sufficient without modification, and then we would immediately have the S parameters given the frequency. Here's another example. An older NPN silicon BJT, which still commonly appears in radios in all kinds of forms, is the 2N3904. Now, this transistor's been around uh, for many decades, and it appears in many different form factors. In fact, in some form factors, it goes by a different name, but uh, underneath, it's still a 2N3904. So it's a transistor that's worth knowing about. It's offered by a variety of manufacturers and under a variety of model names, as I just mentioned. The data sheets for this device are readily available, but the manufacturers will provide the data in somewhat different format. And you probably won't find in any of these cases specific operating point recommendations. Now, I'm not saying that nobody does that, but uh, I think you'll find that most of the data sheets are available do not make specific recommendations for the operating point for this transistor. What you'll find instead is a whole lot of data for collector currents in the range 0.1 to 100 milliamps and collector emitter voltage in the range of 1 to 10 volts. And it, this data will indicate the relevant trade-offs that can be used to narrow down the range of possibilities. Now in the absence of any particular constraint, it should be apparent that a pretty good starting point for, for this particular transistor is 10 milliamps and 5 volts. Now that's arbitrarily chosen, but it's mid-range. It's mid-range in terms of the collector current, and it's mid-range in terms of the collector emitter voltage. So it's a reasonable starting point. And if you find there's something not satisfactory about that, you can always uh, change those values within this range. You most likely will not find S-parameter noise characterization data uh, as part of the data sheet for this transistor. This data is typically available elsewhere. So you can find uh, data files, for example, intended for computer-aided design software. Or you can extract the S-parameters from uh, analysis of the device model, for example, a SPICE netlist. Now you may wonder why this is that uh, for this common transistor, uh, it's hard to find S-parameter data immediately. And for the other transistor, it's common. Uh, this particular transistor has been around for a long time. It certainly precedes the theory of S-parameters and people are kind of used to using it. So it's not to say that you can't design with S parameters for this transistor, it's just that in the applications where this normally appears, most people already kind of know how to do this design using different and older techniques. Whereas with the other transistor, it's a newer transistor and people expect to see uh, S parameter data provided. Okay, fixed bias. This is one particular way to set the collector current and the collector emitter voltage. So let me introduce you to the schematic. So here's our common emitter bipolar transistor. The emitter is grounded. The collector current flows this way. And the base current flows this way. So we can just go ahead and call this I sub B and I sub C. These devices here are capacitors, and they are meant to contain the bias currents. So this capacitor here ensures that the base current also flows through this path, and this capacitor here ensures that all the collector current flows into the collector. And there's no interaction of bias currents or voltages with other devices that may be at the input or output. These devices here, 
are intended to achieve RF-DC isolation. In other words, to isolate the bias from the RF signals. So, for example, you know very high frequencies. And inductors are open circuits and capacitors are short circuits. So, for example, at RF, we should see a very high impedance looking this way. And similarly here. So, at uh, RF frequencies, uh, we should see the RF go in this direction and the RF come out and go in this direction. And no RF should end up in the power supply because, again, these devices are providing very high impedance. At DC, inductors are, of course, short circuits and capacitors are open circuits. So, in this case, the uh, DC flows freely as we would like it to and we can neglect the capacitors. So this is a very general scheme for uh, achieving this isolation. In some cases you may not need the capacitor, in some cases you may not need the inductor, in some cases you may need both. In some cases we will find that you don't need either one because the resistor has a high enough value that the RF is effectively blocked. So these are all possibilities. The reason I show the schematic like this is to account for all those possibilities and of course things may look very different by the time uh, we're done with the design. In any event, at DC this is going to be a short circuit and this is going to be an open circuit. This is going to be a short circuit and this is going to be an open circuit. So this is the case we want to consider for the uh, bias circuit design. Now in fixed bias what happens is the collector pin is tied to the supply through a resistor and the base pin is connected to the power supply through another resistor. So the values of these resistors determine the currents that are flowing in each case. Now we can figure out what's going on here using Kirchhoff's voltage law, that is the voltages in a loop add up to zero. And the loop we can use here looks like this. We start at the power supply we come down this direction and then we come down through the base emitter junction and we end up at ground and at ground we can go back up here. So we start off uh, with VCC, we drop by I sub B times uh, R1 and then we have another drop here associated with the base emitter junction and that completes the loop. So here KVL gives this expression. Now if we substitute the relationship uh, for a bipolar transistor uh, that relates uh, base current to collector current, and then we can solve for the collector current. So we find the collector current is given by beta times the difference between VCC and VBE divided by R1, the resistor in the uh, base bias path. We can also quickly find that the collector emitter voltage right here is given by VCC minus I sub C, which is flowing this way, times RC, the value of that resistor. So we've completely characterized this uh, bias circuit now. So the procedure for doing fixed bias goes as follows. You would use R1 to set the collector current according to this equation. And then you'd use RC to set VCE according to this equation. So that's straightforward enough. There's a problem with this. And the problem is as follows. The collector current depends directly on beta. And as I have undoubtedly mentioned in the previous slide, beta values are notoriously variable. Not only do they vary by a lot, but they're also big. These are values that go from tens to uh, hundreds. So small changes in beta result in big changes in the collector current. A second problem with this is it depends strongly on VBE, and as I'm about to show you, VBE depends strongly on temperature. And the last thing you can assume in a circuit like this is that temperature is going to be a constant. So because of these reasons, it's very difficult to keep the collector current and the collector emitter voltage constant. So this is not recommended.
fact, not only is it not recommended, I would say it's it's very uh, very poor choice. And I'll show you one other reason why it's a bad idea. And that has to do with thermal stability. So, as I just mentioned, the base emitter voltage associated with a specified collector current typically increases by about two millivolts for every one degree Celsius rise in temperature. So just one Celsius increase in temperature changes VBE by about two millivolts. Now, as the temperature is increasing then, what's happening is the base current is increasing. And because the collector current depends on the base current through beta, that's increasing by a lot. As a result, the power dissipated in the transistor increases by an even greater factor because that's proportional to collector current squared. So the temperature of the transistor is increasing because the power dissipated in the transistor is increasing. Well, that's what got us into trouble in the first place. So VBE decreases a little bit more because the temperature is higher. So this is a vicious cycle and it ends up in a situation known as thermal runaway where the transistor uh, goes into some very undesirable state or in some extreme cases may just destroy itself. So how do we mitigate this? Well, a good idea is to make VCE roughly equal to VCC minus VC. So here's that difference. Right? And it's a good idea to make that equal to this drop. Now, that only helps. It doesn't eliminate the problem. The way to eliminate the problem is to choose an appropriate biasing circuit, and that is not fixed biasing. One possible fix, not the only one, is to use a technique known as self-bias. So here's the new circuit for self-bias. The only thing that's changed here is that the source of the base current, I sub B, is now coming from the collector path, whereas previously this base current was coming directly from the power supply. Just go ahead and compare that to the previous slide. This simple change will do a lot to mitigate the effect of beta and temperature instability. And this technique also goes by the name of collector feedback stabilization, just so you know. Uh, Self-bias is a somewhat general idea. Collector feedback stabilization is uh, what this is sometimes called when it's applied specifically to bipolar transistors. So this is the topic of a future lecture. Now one final thing I would like to talk about in this lecture is the topic of active bias. So already you've gotten a taste for the issues that you encounter when designing a bias circuit. And sometimes the only way to properly and fully address those issues is to design a bias circuit which acts like a current source. So here I'm showing current sources. Here's I sub C current source, and here's the I sub B current source, which are literally pumping the right amounts of current into the collector and base terminals. And these circuits would themselves consist of transistors, in this case transistors acting as current sources. So it's fairly common to see transistor amplifiers where one of the transistors is an amplifier, and then you see two or three other transistors which are behaving as current sources, and that is the hallmark of a active bias arrangement. So to summarize, you'd use active bias if you really need a very precise, very tight, a very insensitive uh, bias, and uh, that would be one way to go about achieving it. It's a somewhat more difficult uh, approach to design, certainly more complicated, uh, and it doesn't really change the way we do the RF design. So we're not going to talk about that anymore in this course, but you should know that this is a method and uh, that uh, this kind of technique is out there. This concludes this lecture on an introduction to biasing.